Tanya, and I am with California Sea Grant. I have a fellowship with them for the past two years, um, and I also uh, closely work with the NOAA Marine Debris Program, and I'll explain who these people are in just a second. Um, sea Grant, if you aren't aware, is a federally funded and university partnership. They're um, all across the country, and we have one here in uh, San Diego. And so they work on research and education around coastal issues ranging from marine debris like ocean trash, um, but also you know sea level rise, climate change, um, fisheries issues, things like that. And so um, the marine debris program is um, with the federal government, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they are the federal lead on um, tackling the marine debris issue. And we work on, again, researching and trying to mitigate all the negative impacts associated with marine debris. And so that's kind of why I'm here today is to kind of give that background and kind of tie in how marine debris relates to whales and how they can impact whales and also like, you know, just inform you all and uh, give you some ideas on how, you know, you as individuals and what we collectively can do to help this problem. So um, I'm gonna, I've got like some notes on here. I might refer back to, I just don't wanna forget to mention anything. Um, and I'm gonna be asking you a lot of questions. I want this to be more of an interactive talk. So please feel free to raise your hand um, to answer my questions. Also, if you have any questions, again, this is an informal speech, please raise your hand, interrupt. I'm happy to take questions throughout. Um, and then at the end, we can always have like a Q&A. But uh, to get started, again, I wanna say thank you for being here and um, I've said the words marine debris a few times now. I just want to make sure we're all on the all on the same page before I get going. What can someone raise their hand and tell me what do they think marine debris actually means? What's the definition? How about you? I didn't hear you that well, but I think you said things that get into the ocean, something around those lines, and that is exactly correct. So if you break down the words marine, it's like the ocean debris, trash, ocean trash kind of thing. Um, and yes, yeah, so anything, anything that's man-made that we use on a daily basis that um, you know is disposed of improperly can make their way into the ocean. And so that's kind of the definition that we use of marine debris. So marine debris can range from tiny, tiny pieces called microplastics all the way to what we call consumer debris, which is um, things that we as consumers use every day, whether this is water bottles or food takeout containers, toothbrushes, shampoo bottles, things like that, things that we buy and use on a daily basis, that's consumer debris. Um, all the way up to another level is um, abandoned or lost fishing gear. So I don't know if we have any fishers in the audience, but you know, um, whether it's recreational fishing, like fishing line, weights, or even commercial fishing, that's gonna be big, large nets, buoys, things like that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got you know, from tiny microplastics all the way to giant vessels. So big boats can um, become stranded, they can you know, sink, they can, um, I don't know, uh, they get old and um, not operable. And if they're still in the water, they are marine debris. So marine debris can definitely range. And I think a lot of times you think of marine debris being um, trash or plastic, and that is definitely true, but marine debris can also be, you know, I, like I said, anything man-made. So that can be metals, that can be woods, that can be um, clothing. <laughs> so anything that's not supposed to be the ocean is marine debris. Um, so I want to move on and, um, now that we've kind of discussed a little bit about you know, what marine debris is, there is an estimate back in 2015 that approximately 8 million metric tons of plastic waste enters our oceans every year. And that is a big number, but it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. And so the common analogy is, if you can imagine a dump truck filled to the brim, dumping its load into the oceans every minute for a year. That is the equivalent, and that's a lot of trash. Um, and again, that number only is talking about consumer debris, and um, not it doesn't take into consideration big vessels, which weigh a lot, or fishing gear. So you can imagine that number is probably a lot higher when you consider all the breadth of marine debris. So I want to ask you, how do you think these things get into the ocean? So we've talked about what marine debris is, but how do they make their way into the ocean? Can someone raise their hand? How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? How about you? 
she said wind water and waves and that is very correct yes so um like i said anything can become um marine debris so how they get in there usually they come from the land right and this land-based sources um or it comes from the ocean let's get that to the second but land-based sources are going to be like i said um your trash right and anything can get blown away or washed away right you have I'm sure you've seen um, driving on the highway, maybe some trash flies out the window or the back of a truck or even a garbage truck. I don't know if I've ever seen that. It flies off the top. So wind can definitely be one. Um, maybe if there's a storm, a lot of our storm drains will lead to the oceans. If you were here last month, we had a great talk on watersheds, anything from higher elevations, making it all the way down to the oceans. Um, yes, so storm drains all lead to the, to, um, the oceans. Anything in the streets is going to get washed away. Um, also... Maybe even, um, unfortunately, littering, whether that's intentional or accidental, but um, maybe there's no trash cans in the area, or maybe there's no um, infrastructure, maybe there's no trash service in your area. Maybe you live out in a rural area where you know we don't, you don't get as adequate tra trash cans or tra uh, dump trucks coming to pick up your trash, things like that it might lead to um, dumping in areas. Um, maybe the dumping prices are too high and you can't afford to dump at, at, a, at an actual dump. Things like that. There's many issues as to why things might be entering our environment, but whether it's upland in the streets or, um, you know, anywhere, it will eventually wash to the oceans because of one, gravity, storm, water, wind, exactly. Um, but there's another way, um, also out in the middle of the ocean, when you have um, vessels out there, again, just like pieces of you know, wrappers or uh, trash can blow away on land. They can also blow away out of a fishing vessel, a, a carnival cruise, a, a, a military boat, like any types of plastic wrappers or any such trash can blow. So there's that. Um, and then there's also, like I mentioned, fishing gear. So whether this is accidentally cut or tangled or ripped off, um, once it's not associated with a fishing boat anymore, it's now in the ocean and it's marine debris. Um, and then again, we talked about boats. That's also one. Um, so I want to ask you, what do you think the most common type of marine debris is? And we've, we've gone through a few different types now, but what do you think is the most common? Plastic. Plastic. That's the number one answer we always get. And so, yes, you are correct. Um, on land, it's going to be single-use plastics. And at sea, it's going to be ghost nets. And I'll get into what a ghost net is in just a second. Um, but I want to ask... Um, Single-use plastic. Who can maybe raise their hand and tell me what is a single-use plastic versus what is a multi-use plastic? Plastic bottle. Plastic bottle is a great example. And why is that a single-use plastic? What do you do with it? Why is it called single-use? It's recyclable, and I do recycling myself. That is excellent. You definitely should recycle a plastic bottle if you're using it. Use it once. I use it once, and I pick up, my, pick up trash from Newport Harbor. Yes, exactly. So a single-use plastic is something that you would use once and throw it away. And a multi-use plastic is something you would use more than once and then throw it away. Um, both being you would throw it away, which maybe hold on to that thought for later. But um, <laughs> So one key difference, though, is a single-use plastic is something that was designed to be used once, like a plastic fork, a plastic bag, a plastic water bottle. They're brittle. They're fragile. Um, you don't really want to use them more than once. You probably most often don't. You could use them more than once, right? You could use that fork again. You most likely don't. Um, whereas a multi-use plastic is something that was designed to be used more than once, is a little more durable, um, reusable. And these are things um, such as maybe a toothbrush is plastic, but you, you brush your teeth once and you don't throw it away. You keep using it for six months we're supposed to be right um and then maybe shampoo bottle or something like that they are plastic but you use them more than once um anyway so a single use plastic is something that definitely is designed to be used once so i just want to i like to make that clear difference there um and i do want to notify you if you don't know that nine out of the ten top ten items that are found on beach cleanups across california um are single use plastic food and beverage packages so there's um uh California Coastal Cleanup Day every September, and they have a huge data collection there. Nine out of ten items are single-use plastic food and beverage containers, and that means your cups, straws, lids, takeout containers, food packaging, things like that. Um, and so just putting that out there, that those are what you are finding on California beaches. Now, moving back to what I said earlier, ghost nets, that's the most common at-sea marine debris. And this is when, again, I think I mentioned this already, um, lost or abandoned fishing nets, 
um, that aren't associated with their fishing boat anymore. Um, but again, they're designed to catch fish. And even though they're not um, attached to their boat and they're not being actively used as a fishing item, uh, they still work in the ocean. They still catch fish. And not only fish, they catch um, dolphins, turtles, sharks, a lot of things. So they're a really huge issue. Um, traps and things, they're designed to trap and catch fish. And that's what they do, even though they're not actively being a part of the boat anymore. Um, so I want to ask now, what do you, what debris types do you think affect whales? Because we are at a whale festival, so I really want to tie that in. What do you think is the debris type that affects whales the most? Yes. Microplastic. Wow, that's great. Oh. Yes, you are. I mean, that's not, it's kind of a trick question. All debris types affect whales. Um, and usually we don't get that one first. <laughs> usually we get nets because I just mentioned it. But um, yes, and again, all plastics have the ability to affect whales. I'm going to go through them a little bit. Or sorry, all marine debris. But um, microplastics is a big one. And first off, who, who can tell me what a microplastic is? I know I've said that a, a few times now, but what's the definition of a microplastic? How about you in the back? Yes, he said a really, really small piece of plastic, and that is absolutely correct. So um, there are, we usually classify microplastics as anything smaller than a pencil eraser. That's a microplastic. Anything bigger, we call macroplastic. Micro meaning small, macro meaning big. So um, again, to, um, I want to uh, point out another part of the definition of microplastic is that there are two types of microplastics. There's microplastics that were designed to be small, and this might be microbeads in like face wash exfoliants. Um, we might not see that much more here in the US. We did have a ban um, um, a while back, um, but in other countries, they definitely still have that, um, where they're tiny, tiny little pieces that would just wash down the drain as you'd wash your face. Um, and then they also have um, another form of microplastics that are designed to be small, are gonna be called nurdles or pre-production pellets. And these are what plastic is before it is uh, melted down and formed into the products we know and love every day, like bottles, bags, toys, things like that. So they come in these little tiny little uh, pellets called nurdles. So those are a type of microplastic. Now there's also um, other things like called nanoplastics. And so if you can imagine, nanoplastics are even tinier than microplastics. So I said microplastics were things um, smaller than a pencil eraser. Nanoplastics are actually the plastics that you can't even see with your naked eye. They're small in the width of your hair. You really need a microscope to look at them, but they exist. Um, and they usually come from, uh, unfortunately, our clothing, our linens, our bedding, our carpets, any textile. Um, those types of things, and they, they shed. Actually, when you move your body, they're shedding. A lot of our clothing and um, beddings and carpets and things like that are made of plastic nowadays. Polyester is a plastic. Um, nylon is a plastic. Um, so that's unfortunate. And then when you wash your clothes, unfortunately, all those microfibers, that's what they're called, um, are really small, and they don't get caught in their filtration systems, and then the water drains into our oceans as well. Even in our dryers, they shoot out the, the hot air mixed with microfibers. So I know it's a daunting issue. They're everywhere, um, unfortunately. But yes, back, back to the topic today. How does this affect whales? How are these tiny little pieces of plastic gonna affect whales? Does anyone have an idea? Yes, that's correct. He said whales are big, but they still eat things. And that's exactly right. So some whales are filter fe feeders, baleen whales. They have their baleen is like a teeth. They, they, um, open with, they swim with their mouth wide open and they eat. What do they eat? What do baleen whales eat? Does anyone know? Plankton. Krill, yes, which are like plankton, yes. And so they're small, they're really small. And what also small? Microplastics, yes, yeah, so that can get into a whale. Even though whales are big, they still can eat microplastics. Um, and uh, I will say there's a lot of research going on to try and understand how that can impact whales and other creatures. We don't really know definitively yet, but there's a lot of research going on right now. Um, okay, the second debris type um, that we mentioned that can affect whales, consumer debris, which consumer debris again was what? What do we classify as consumer debris? 
Right, bottles, things that we consume on a daily basis, anything that we as consumers buy, use, that kind of thing. Yes, that can be takeout, wear, bottles, things like that, yes. Um, so this type of plastic can end up in the water, in the oceans. Beached whales have been found with plastic bags and other plastics in their stomachs. So when they wash up on the beach, unfortunately, um, and they're, they're cut open, they're called a necropsy, like an autopsy, but for... Uh, animals, um, they find, you know, for science, trying to figure out how did it die, a lot of whales, and it might not be the reason they died, but they find, no matter what, almost all animals that are opened up have plastic in their stomachs. There was a beached whale in Norway that found with 30 plastic bags in his stomach. So, yeah, awful. But, um, why do you think it's bad for whales and any other sea animals to eat plastic? Why is it bad? Yes? It's bad for them can't digest it. Right, they can't digest it. It's not their food. <laughs> it's not their natural food, right? Um, and they they end up eating a lot of it, though, because they can't tell the difference what it is. They aren't familiar with these things. They don't see them every day. A uh, plastic bag in the water often looks like a jellyfish, right, which are a lot of um, food for, for other animals. Um, so they eat it all, and then they have this false feeling of being full. They have all this plastic in their stomach, but they're not getting any nutrients, and they actually end up starving to death, unfortunately. Um, also, what is plastic made out of? Does anybody know? Plastic. Plastic. What's plastic made out of? I know we use it every day, and a lot of things. What do you think it's made out of? What is that? Petroleum. Yes, oil and chemicals. <laughs> that's what it's made out of. And so, um, well, one, that's probably not good for your digestive system. But two, um, oil is hydrophobic. And when I say hydrophobic, I mean, has anyone ever tried to wash a oily, greasy pan? Right? It's kind of hard. The water and the oil separate. That's what I mean. Oil is hydrophobic. Hydro meaning water, like hydration. Phobic meaning scared of. Phobia. We say oil is scared of water. That's why it separates. It doesn't, uh, it's not easy to clean. You need soap. Um, but so in the water, when a plastic piece made of oil, it gets in the water, it uh, repels the water. And in return, it attracts anything else in the water, which can be um, any other pollutants or contaminants. Maybe this is pesticides. Maybe this is other oils and chemicals, right? So it becomes um, kind of a sponge for these chemicals and toxicants. And so um, the longer a piece of plastic is in the water, the more toxic it can get, depending on, you know, where it is. Also, um, getting back to microplastics, as something degrades um, and breaks down to smaller and smaller pieces it can um, get more surface area in a sense. And so more surface area means more attracting of pollutants. So the smaller and the longer a piece of plastic is in the ocean, the more toxic it can be. And again, we are, there's a lot of science around this, really trying to figure out how that is going to affect sea creatures as well as humans. But again, we don't really know for sure yet, but a lot of science is going on about that. Um, and then the third consumer debris, or sorry, the third marine debris item was fishing gear, right? And so this is how it affects whales is entrapment and entanglement in nets, ropes, and traps. And so if you think about it, whales and all, all, a lot of other sea creatures, they don't have opposable thumbs, all right? That we are the lucky ones. We, they can't untangle themselves. They can't get out of these traps. And again, traps and nets were designed to catch fish. <laughs> so again, when they're out there, ghosting it up, they are still catching and killing a lot of sea creatures. Um, and so though a lot, as I mentioned, a lot of debris types can affect whales, I think this is probably the biggest one that is really harming whale populations today. Um, and so solving this can be really tricky, right? Because um, fishing is a huge part of our way of life. A lot of people eat fish. A lot of people make a living off of fisheries. Fisheries aren't going anywhere. We're not going to just shut down fisheries. Um, they're, they're sticking around. So the, the, the trick is to try and figure out how we can make a more sustainable and um, fishery and, and have whales and fisheries coexist in a sense. Also other animals, not just whales, but we're at a whale festival. Um, <laughs> and um, also when you think about it, fisheries exist all over the globe, right? And so there is um, a lack of consensus and enforcement and laws out in the wild, wild, wild open ocean. So you can't um, expect everyone to abide by rules or you don't have a governing office to say, you know, this is the rule and you can't do this. But I will say that the United States has the most heavily regulated fisheries in almost some of the most in, in the world. 
Um, but we still have these issues happening right here close to you know, our shores. But it's just a complicated issue, but I want to say that we are trying. <laughs> there are efforts around the world trying. There are global working groups filled with experts and scientists trying to you know, figure this out. Um, we've got state level, you know, um, initiatives like sanctuaries. We've got, you know, federally recognized marine protected areas where you can't fish in them to try and have like a sanctuary for, for marine life. Um, we also have um, agencies like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that um, work together with fishers who try and have um, regulations and best management practices, such as, you know, how many traps they can set, you know, when and where they can set these traps. Um, how much rope line they're allowed to use, things like that. They're really trying to figure out. They even have an incentive program to have fishers go out and collect their lost gear so that it's not in harm's way to potentially entangling a whale. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, locally, you know, in Southern California, there's an organization called Boreo um, that works out of uh, Argentina, actually, but they're moving into Southern California to um, work with fishers to grab their, their nets, incentivizing them to bring them back to shore, not discard them or anything. Um, they're old ones, ones that don't work anymore. They'll take them and they'll recycle them and they'll put them, um, repurpose them into products, consumer products like um, frisbees, sunglasses, skateboards, Jenga. You can play a game that, you know, feel good about yourself that you helped uh, take a net out of the water to harm an oil, but you're playing with it. And yeah, it's, you know, it's great. There's a lot of initiatives happening. Um, and there's also small scale organizations like Stand Up to Trash that are hosting beach cleanups, providing education and community empowerment, you know, to help the community learn and do something about this awful issue. So high five to Stand Up to Trash. And um, I just want to say that, you know, marine debris is widespread, comes from many sources, um, is everyone's problem, right? We all love the ocean. We all use these things every day that can end up in the ocean. So we all can't point the, point the finger on anyone, but it's a collective issue that we can solve. It's a human-made problem, but it's a human-made solution that we can, we can do. So um, I want to say that there's not one size fits all solution, right? There's going to be um, many different areas where we can tackle this problem. And I want to say there's about three stages in the system that you can actually input um, initiatives. And so one is clean up what's already out there, right? And that's what we're doing today. Beach cleanups like today, clean up what's there. Because even if we stop polluting tomorrow, none there's still gonna be eight million metric tons out there that need to need to be picked up. So clean up is definitely a you know important way to go combat this issue. Um, two would be intercept what is on its way to the ocean. It hasn't maybe made its way to the ocean yet, but it maybe evaded waste management. And this could be in the form of, you know street sweepers or trash catchment systems or um, the trash booms in rivers or maybe doing river cleanups, street cleanups, those types of things. They even have, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Mr. Trash Wheel. It's uh, in Baltimore. They have this huge contraption. They put giant googly eyes on him for the community to love and enjoy, but it collects, skims the water and collects trash in the harbor before it makes its way into the ocean. So these are things called, we, we like to say, interception um, captive systems, you know, before it makes its way into the ocean. Um, but these two solutions, cleaning up and intercepting, are very um, end of the road and reactive solution to the problem, whereas the last one I'm about to say is more of a preventive, right? We want to prevent the waste from the source in the first place. Um, and so this can take form of product or material bans, which um, you all might be familiar with the plastic bag ban, these types of things. There is actually a lot of research that shows that before the bag ban and after the bag ban, the amount of plastic bags being found at beach cleanups has dr drops drastically. So maybe that's showing the effectiveness of these types of, of policies. Um, there's also maybe companies can start to redesign their products to be made plastic free or maybe more recyclable. Maybe that means changing up the material um, to try and just like fit what their um, audience is, you know, where they are, wh what type of infrastructure they have there, those types of things. Um, but also on the more individual level, you have your purchasing power, right? You can vote with your dollar when you go to the store, when you're buying things, um, you know, see what options you have. Uh, you can buy the things that maybe aren't plastic or maybe um, are a little more easily recyclable, those types of decisions. Um, and the last one is just education and awareness, right? So doing it right now, um, learn about the issue. Um, so before I go, I just want to say like, you know, these are the things that you can do as an individual, become aware of the issue, right? Awareness is the first step, but don't stop there. Be aware, learn, come and, um, you know, the more you learn, the more you'll understand, the more you can actually reflect on your own lives where do I fit in this problem? How can I be a part of the solution? And then the second one is 
model the behavior you want to see. If you want to see less trash in the ocean, you're going to have to create less trash. <laughs> and that might be a hard truth, but take a, an inventory of how much you waste or even consume, right? Um, the less waste we create, the less it'll end up or have the potential to be marine debris or affecting the oceans. Um, now, I, I like to say to be mindful when you purchase or consume, you know, do you really need it? <laughs> um, we as Americans, as, um, you know, uh, global leaders and um, developed countries tend to um, purchase and consume and throw away at an alarming rate and far greater than what our trash waste management can um, keep up with. As you can see, you know, we have great waste management, but we still have trash all over, as you, as you might have noticed as you were cleaning up. Um, so I always kind of like to say when you're throwing something away, think to yourself, like, where is away, right? Like, what does that mean? Um, an analogy I sometimes use with, I teach kids a lot, is, you know, I, I take kids and I say, hey, if I gave you a bag of chips for lunch and you ate your chips and you have your wrapper, would you go and dig a hole and put the chip bag in it and cover it up and that's your solution? And kids always go, no, like, no, that's, not, I would put it in a trash can, I put it in a trash can. And I'm like, okay, and that's usually, with kids, it's like, yeah, that's exactly right. But uh, as you get older, we, we still think of that as an adults. And it's like, no, 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 like think a little more about what happens when you put in a trash can. It's gonna get picked up. It's gonna get put in a dump truck. It's gonna take you to a, a landfill, a fancy word for a giant hole in the ground that we put all our, craft, our trash in. So if kids can get it at a young age of like, we shouldn't be burying our trash, but adults, we think that's okay. Uh, you know, there's a disconnect there where, and I'm not saying that, you know, I know the, the, the right solution yet, but just start to think about it. Like, are landfills the right solution? Is that the best way we can be doing this? Why do we have so much trash? Why do we even have trash in the first place? You know, like this disposable throwaway lifestyle is um, very new, very recent, only from the 50s and on. So, but we have the power to try to change that and uh, just really get those gears thinking about, you know, when, when you're purchasing things or using things. Um, we all heard of reduce, reuse, recycle, right? But there's there's the three R's. I like to say there's like seven R's before that. There's, you know, refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, repair. <laughs> Rot is another R, which is synonymous for compost, right? Like not all of us have compost or ability to compost, but maybe look into it. If you have a yard or if you have kids, like there's vermicompost, worms. Kids love worms. I don't know. Get out in your yard. Get out with nature. Have, plant a garden. <laughs> there's a lot of things you can look into. And then recycle, right? It's kind of the last one. You should go through all of those first before recycling. Um, but um, when I say that, I, I kind of mean more for plastics. Um, there's very effective um, for other materials, like uh, glass recycling, aluminum recycling, paper, carbon recycling. Those are pretty effective, but plastic recycling is really not. So really just take into more consideration. Try the, try the first six R's before you get to recycle if you really can. Try to refuse it. Use some alternatives. But again, if you can't, don't beat yourself up. And um, don't go out and buy all these new products either. Like Use what you have. Um, and just don't feel bad if like your grocery store doesn't offer you options that are, aren't plastic free. Don't feel bad if you don't have infrastructure, recycling infrastructure for certain things in, in your area. Like it's not your fault, it's a societal issue, but just more of a reason that um, we need to get together and um, you know become a community that demands these types of things, works towards these things. We all want a better future, better oceans, better worlds for the whales and all the other animals in the ocean. Um, and then lastly, I just want to leave you with, because it's We're at a Whale Festival, um, I did do some research on um, entanglement reporting hotlines. If you have boats, if you all, you know, I don't know who here um, has a boat or goes out into the water, but if you do, there is an entanglement reporting hotline. It's one eight seven seven sos whale without the E. <laughs> Easy to remember, but uh, I do have the number here if you want to come up after and you can write it down. Um, and the prompt reporting is key. They like you to follow the, the whale if you can, but stay 100 yards away because they are dangerous. The line can actually affect your vessel, damage your vessel kind of thing. Um, but yeah, videos, photos are very important to them. But just putting that out there, that if you ever come into a contact with an with a entangled whale, there is um, a hotline you can call. But all right, with that, I'm going to stop talking and take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes. Back in the day, when I went on a cruise ship, I'd see them throw trash, big bags, in the ocean. Is there laws for that now? I'm going to say there are. Um, there are. There definitely are. But again, it is very hard to enforce out in the open ocean. You know, you could be the only cruise ship out for miles. And, it, you know, 
no one sees you do it, did it happen? So unfortunately, there are, yeah. it still happens, it's like but it's, yeah, it, it, it's something that they're trying to get better at and creating more of an incentive to bring it back to shore and have easily um, disposal options for them. You is have kind not of... mentioned cigarette butts at all. Yeah, so when I said nine of the 10 are um, beverage, uh, food and beverage packaging found in California beaches, the, the number one is cigarette butts though. <laughs> but I was kind of trying to get on that um, packaging um, kick. But yes, the number one is cigarette butts, unfortunately, yes. Yes. How long do cigarette butts last for on the beach or when they go through the ocean? Is that been a study? That's a great question. There, So there's not been a consensus on that because there's so many different environments, like so many different variables, like whether you're in what climate you're in or what kind of, if you're in the water or not. Like, so there's, it's so variable. They don't have a, a definitive number like, oh, it's this many years or whatnot. But it's a while and I, you can kind of, as you walk around or pick them up, you can see as they degrade, they're still there. And like a, a common thing you might hear is that you know any every plastic that was invented since the 50s is still in our environment somewhere today. Maybe it's tiny nano plastic, but it, it doesn't go away. Um, plastic is very you know durable, and that's why it's a great material. But it doesn't biodegrade at, at all. So. <coughs> What happened to the ship that sunk? So some ships stay there because it's easier. It's it's a lot. It's, it's time, money, energy to to resurface a ship. I think if it's sunk, it's gonna stay there. And then they, but um, the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. government will go out and remove any of the harmful, like hazardous materials, like oil or chemicals on it. So we'll get rid of that stuff. But the ship itself, like the the hull and everything, will stay. And it kind of turns into an artificial reef, which can be in a sense, helpful for marine life. So algae will grow yeah. on it, things will grow on it. You'll kind of get like all the fishes around there. So that is kind of like a, a benefit that comes out of it, but it, it's kind of just, we can't really do much about it, unfortunately. I'm gonna assume that is just like this, a barrel, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll be around too if you'd like to come up and talk. Um, again, my name is Tanya. Thank you very much for coming out today. Um, do you want me to do any um, highlights for the food that's here now? <laughs> oh, is it here? Yeah. There is food in the back. Um, oh. Subway. So I guess we can adjourn. <laughs> Thank you.